<laughs> no, you do. Thanking folks, and, and really, I think my hope and my concern early on was, you know, this is going to be as good as the participation in the conversation. And, and my sense is it's been really powerful, and uh, thanks to everybody for, for keeping it going. So as Jeff and I are reflecting on how little energy we have this morning, we're relying on all of you to keep this presentation going far. Um, I think maybe we're going to start right out of the gate. If, knowing what you know about real estate, how it works, how it doesn't in your community, maybe not in your community, how would you, if you could wave a magic wand, make as much money in real estate as you possibly could? How would you do it? Crystal ball. Yeah. Know the future. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Buy low, sell high. All right. Buy low, sell high. I had somebody so not yesterday. Buy right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> so not buy right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's just in the normal. Not the smoking. Any other thoughts? Be a power player, developer in our community. Some strength to say what we're gonna do and not do. Right. How would you make a bunch of money in real estate there, Mary Paul? Why are you putting me on the spot? Just <laughs> <Steve> my breakfast. <laughs> um, I think. I heard it earlier, but yeah, I think uh, the ability to buy property when in a down market um, and then be able to develop it in a growing market and also be able to leverage some of that land where you can actually sell it and put some significant revenue back to the organization. Yeah, other thoughts? Buy parking lots. <laughs> Different realities too. I think Jeff had mentioned yesterday that you know uh, communities like Duluth aren't feeling the highs or the lows nearly as much as other communities, and I think even Minneapolis is is a lot more insulated than you know the coasts or or Las Vegas, for example, Phoenix area, where they they, they have seen and continue to see I think really big fluctuations in their market when the market uh, takes turns. I think what we're hoping to get into this through this presentation is that. There's a ton of nuance in this, especially when you have to layer in funders and regulations and this push and pull between affordability and you know fixing boarded and vacant properties. And so to the degree that we can we get so caught up in it on a day-to-day -day level to try and separate from it a bit and, and, and say where how do we position ourselves, assuming if we had the crystal ball we knew where things were going, how can we make sure that we're positioned as well as possible, and then really try and fight against a lot of the currents that are out there as it relates to funding, uh, politics, and all and the press on all these things, and try and gain some movement in a way that an investor would or isn't thinking in, in, in how they go about trying to make money in real estate. So, so with that, uh, thanks for, for being part of the conversation. Up and down markets, I don't know if, I don't think we've ever talked about this at a national Kind of conference level, and um, we put it out there, and I think there, I think there is something to it. But hoping we can build on this idea and, and see if we can come up with with you know, kind of a formula or a playbook that land trusts can use moving forward um, in thinking about this stuff. So our goals: understand the opportunities and the pitfalls unique to community land trusts. Um, I think it does require us to think more like an investor. Um, in, in how we deal with funders, how we deal with politicians, all those kinds of things. Um, share our experiences so that uh, we, can, we can talk about maybe where we, we had some huge wins and or when we've made some mistakes. Um, explore the possibility for all us to engage in something bigger. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if, you know, uh, coming into a, a down market, we had $10 million. You know, because I, I know had I had $10 million in 2010, we could have made $20 million in affordability gap, if not in real estate, but the, those dollars aren't there. But if we could, if we can get uh, folks that control the purse strings to help support thoughts and ideas like this, and, and now that we've proven that we kind of know what we're doing, to say, all right, these, these, these folks know what they're doing, it's okay to invest $10 million in them because they're not going to squander it away and they're going to do good with the, the $10 million. And then hopefully have uh, a, a great 90 minutes and learn from one another. So kind of continuation, big picture, market impacts, and we're gonna go into a lot more detail on all these things, but um, you know, what 
I think generally speaking, as there's, there's more uh, concerns and, and tension about where the market is going, mortgage companies and underwriting get, get a bit tighter. Um, they get concerned about you know, how much they're gonna loan to on value. Um, I think we see uh, especially lower income households paying the burden for that because they don't have as much cash into the deal and, and things are just getting a little riskier and I think banks already, at least I'm feeling, um, are tightening the screws a little bit on what, what, what's required of buyers, uh, looking for a little bit more income documentation, um, you know, really checking into what debts are sitting out there, uh, maybe taking a closer look at, at what the values are in, in a certain market to make sure that when they make a mortgage loan to a buyer uh, that they're, um, they're, they're making a good bet. And, and I think we're a bit protect, protected because of our, uh, the loan to value that we provide some cushion on with, with, with our affordability investments. But even that I feel is kind of constricting. Cap rates, this is something that over the last, I don't know, five years here in Minnesota have, has really been plaguing um, our members uh, as the, and I, I get this wrong, but as the cap rates go down, that differential between the leasehold appraisal and the fee simple appraisal gets bigger. And so there are instances where that in, inhibits a potential buyer, especially on, on a resale from, from, in our case it was, from being able to step in and get a mortgage to be able to purchase the property. Ironically, this is one of those things that as interest rates are going up, that cap rate is then going, I mean, uh, is going down which is, which is decreasing that differential between leasehold uh, values and the, and the fee simple um, appraisal. Um, it's like cap rate. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking to... I, I can't, and the, the, here's the maddening thing about it. I mean, I think several <laughs> of the things in, in this space we have limited control over we may have limited understanding of, but nonetheless, they push us around and change our reality, right? right. So, so it doesn't really, I mean, the only takeaway for me on, on the whole cap rate thing is, you know, I, I could study up and be completely conversant and give you all a lecture on that. You'd all even wouldn't remember it unless you're <laughs> crazy, freaking brilliant and have to use, or have to use it all the time. But I think the, it's a to-do for us in the, in, the, in the sort of CLT movement industry, whatever we want to call it these days, to be thinking about, well, there, there probably ought to be a better way to deal with that so that we don't get whacked with that again. Because it doesn't really have an impact on any of our economic realities when we're helping people buy a house, at least in my understanding. Maybe I'm missing something. I think it's just the tool that got used to come up with some kind of appraisal methodology. It's a commercial cap rate that they're using? It is. Yeah. So that the commercial cap rate is given a, a net operating income on a commercial property, there's a, a, an industry established cap rate for a market that changes every time, by which you can determine the value of a commercial property. Which we don't sell. Buy it. Or at least. We're talking about houses here, so yeah. it is, it's mind boggling that that's what they're using. So with, with the kind of the some of the mystery behind the scenes is, is appraisers take a look at what our individual lease fee rates are. So in our case, it's $20 a month. They multiply that by the cap rate and then they, they determine over a period of time what that differential between what a standard fee simple appraisal would be and what that leasehold appraisal would be. But that cap rate fluctuates based on what the market's doing, based on interest rates. At a, you know, it's not just the, the mortgage interest rate, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's a 10-year treasury rate maybe is what they, they base it on. And that, over the last five years, <laughs> in our early years, when interest rates were a little bit higher, the differential, and this is just kind of, I think, the Jeff Corey and, and Jeff Washburn explanation, is that the difference between a leasehold and a fee simple mortgage uh, uh, appraisal it was maybe three to four thousand dollars in Minneapolis. Um, it wasn't a lot of money, and so it didn't really matter much. The last five years, that differential was up to twenty thousand dollars on a lot of our homes. So when somebody was, let's say we had a we had a homeowner whose home was worth, they're, they're going to sell their home. It appraised at two hundred thousand. The affordable land trust price was one hundred fifty thousand dollars. They go to resell, and that buyer household is looking to get a first mortgage on their property. That first mortgage lender orders an appraisal on the property, 
we get a, a, a leasehold appraisal. That leasehold appraisal today, maybe you know a year ago, was coming back at 180,000, even though the value of the fee simple appraisal was $200,000. So in, in the example I just gave, the math kind of works in that the land trust affordability gap based on that leasehold appraisal was still 20% of of the, the $150,000 um, you know, land trust price, you know, give or take, but, but in some instances the math didn't work and so the, the, that leasehold appraisal kind of tripped us up from time to time. And it depended on the market, it depended on when, when homes were brought in the trust and stuff. All I'm getting at is that big picture, it does start to play into, and I think what we're gonna see now is that differential, especially as interest rates are going up, that differential between the leasehold appraisal and the fee simple appraisal shrinking back down. Does that help? Uh, housing conditions. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a two-way street here. I think it's been a seller's market. You know, if something you get fixed in a home, a seller's like, I'll put it on the market. Somebody will buy it and they can take care of it because it's, it's worked in their favor. As the market deteriorates, or if it does deteriorate, there then starts to become the situation where there are boarded up homes, there are people breaking in, in our case, stealing copper out, and the, and the, and the housing condition can get worse as well. So understanding kind of how and when uh, that, that market plays itself out. Realtors in the real estate industry, um, you know, de depending on if there's a plethora of realtors and when they get into the market, uh, right now, uh, you know, it, it had been lean times for, for realtors. There was a lot of sales going on, um, but they were fighting for, for buyers and sellers and there were a lot of realtors in the industry as I think the market, if, if it turns, Realtors may fall out and do other things because there isn't going to be a lot of opportunity or realtors will shift from a buyer-seller representation to working on the REO, REO market and really trying to focus on working closely with banks and selling to investors. Um, just kind of understanding where, where people's push points are. And then funding opportunities and deficits. We'll, we'll spend some time talking about this. Um, in the ideal world, uh, when, we, when we started to feel that we were falling into a market housing market crash, you know, that would be the time that we'd want funders to, to step up with a lot of money. And typically, a lot of things need to, to crash and burn before funding steps up. And I, I think a great example of that, and we'll probably reference it a couple times, NSP. There was a lot of money that was unleashed. Arguably, the money was unleashed three or four years too late. It was helpful, and we all did a lot of good with it. But had we had it in the earlier days to compete and not use those dollars to, to fix boarded and vacant and copper stripped homes, we could have done a whole heck of a lot more and we could have arguably helped a lot more lower income households into home ownership. So uh, it's interesting to be thinking about this session and thinking about the years we've been, I've been working with Washburn with others in, in the, in the industry, right? So this up and down market that I'm remembering real, real clearly a colleague of ours who's now retired, uh, it, it, and this would be like in 2004, five, six, saying, this can't continue, this can't continue, it's gonna crash, I think it's gonna, you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember who? Uh, it was Fizzo. Oh, Fizzo, yeah. okay. <laughs> it was just like, like, and I was initially thinking, ah, ah, ah. He was right. Ultimately, you know, the, the crash happened. Um, and, and so I think like, it, it, it's, it seems almost um, uh, too obvious to say out loud, but it's real. Like these, these things will change, we're going to need to be dealing with it. And so to try to be a couple of steps ahead of it and thinking about it is, is what makes, m makes the most sense to the extent that we can. And, 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 and so I think like um, to sort of keep, keep, one's, um, keep one's perspective, keep, keep, keep balanced, keep thoughtful because it's, it, it could get a little nutty coming up in the next year or two or three folks. Um, I'm curious who was working in the industry during the, the foreclosure crisis, who, who's in the room? Um, so what it, a, a couple learnings that, that you remember, Any, anything? come to mind? It was crazy. <laughs> it was just nuts. I mean, there was so much opportunity, and to Jeff's point, 
the money wasn't always lining up with the opportunities. And then, in the case of the city of Minneapolis, they had all this money that they had to spend, and then they would call you up on a Friday, and they would say, can you do this project? And you'd have like an hour to do the analysis and make a decision. <laughs> like, it was just nuts. And it was really sad because there was just so much wealth lost in that process for, for homeowners. It was just really, really sad. Um, I mean, there were a lot of investors that were speculators that got foreclosed on too, but there were a lot of homeowners that lost their property. I learned that Deutsche Bank is Satan incarnate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, single family <coughs> rental inspections are a joke. It's the conditions under which people were living in those yeah, was horrendous. Yeah, we had someone on our staff who was documenting um, with photographs pictures of houses we were buying. It was like just heartbreaking to see stuff uh, on, for all the reasons you could imagine. Whether it was graffiti painted on the walls before people left, the kids' toys, um, just yeah, intense. And 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 I think also right. Uh, it's not gonna probably last either. Um, if, if anything, like the more I'm doing this work, the more I think like we should be pushing, pushing for less of a market. <laughs> it's a, like the only real fix I think is to sort of say like this, this market doesn't work for poor people, right? The next one's not gonna either. But the whole sort of overall economic system we're aware isn't working for, for the people that we're here to serve. So what we can do in that is sort of recognize the waves, recognize that they're not going to last forever, and act when we can act, and act in the ways that we can act. To, to, to get a toehold, to do something good for folks. And in the meantime, I think keep, keep looking for ways to sort of change the bigger picture. Um, I think that the turns are what I remember most in some ways, so this temporary bit, like, you know, when it started to crash, a bit, a bit terrifying, and then also seeing it go the other way <laughs> was, was a little bit crazy. Um, and so just keeping that in mind, like this is our reality, head down, keep doing it, but also keep, keep looking at the horizon and see what's coming next. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is we're not in that alone. Everybody that we work with, all of our stakeholders are gonna be shifting, are gonna be thinking differently as well. I mentioned yesterday to having a conversation with the Wells Fargo guy about buying a foreclosure and the, like before it all happened and he's like, well, how much do you think, Cal, we can negotiate with you about that? Well, Jeff, I just don't think that's probably a very good idea for you to try to negotiate with us and I think you could burn some bridges and golly, you know, we had them giving us properties by the end of the crisis and it, it's just so hard to know what's coming and how folks are going to think about it and, and, and look look at the the same problem we're looking at but from a different side with different stakes for them right um, I will will say also that you know both both sides have opportunities both sides have have their risks um, Washburn's going to talk more about the down market but I will say that we did more good work in a down market than I ever would have dreamt we could do. We bought so many houses, did so much fantastic work to them, um, and, and then we also did too much work to some of them because we had to spend the money and we didn't have time to spend it on more houses, um, which, was, which was also its own crazy thing. Um, I, I think the other thing is th this tempo bit. You know, we were, when the crash happened, we were in the process of building about eight or 10 houses and had four more on the drawing board that we had funded that we hadn't put a shovel in the ground on. And we had to do different things based on which neighborhoods they were in to, to finish and sell them. Um, so we had to, we, we ended up getting help from MHFA in the city to sort of make those happen, to, make, to get some extra investment to sell some of the houses where the market crashed faster than, than other places. And then we just had to sort of write off a few because it just wasn't tenable to do them anymore. And then even though the market came back a little bit quicker in Duluth to be viable for new construction, MHFA lagged behind and wouldn't fund us for new construction because that, that that's what, wasn't what they were funding for a, a whole bunch of years. So I think one other thing that we didn't talk about so much yet is, the, is other variables. 
the, so there's the up market and the down market, but then there's also what what what's going to happen with this interest rate thing? That's you know they're they're approaching rates now that are higher than I've worked in, and I've been doing this for 24 years. I, I need to start pushing our folks to think about what happens if they get to 10 percent, 11 percent, 12 percent in a down market. Uh, it's it's very interesting to contemplate and just think about that. And then the the pandemic bit, right? Um, it. it you know, you'd think in the up market, resales boom always, but not not in the first two years of the pandemic. In our experience, did that happen? And so, it's it's an up and down market, but it's also other other variables as well. So we can kick it over. Um, and that the ocean liner thing, I, I forgot to say, one of my finance committee members was. Uh, he was explaining like when the when the shift was going down back in the foreclosure crisis, he was like, "Yeah, Jeff, trying to uh, trying to turn this uh, new construction ship around is a little bit like trying to spin an ocean liner on a dime." And uh, it was actually a pretty apt analogy because it, it you just can't change that stuff as fast. By contrast, act rehab you can move a little faster, except when the supply line is the supply chain is broken. So. Um, uh, on the, uh, on the, speaking straight up on the up market side for a bit here, um, I would say that right now the height of the affordable housing problem, the, the awareness of the appro uh, affordable housing problem is at the highest point that it's been in, in my career in, in terms of across the board, uh, funders getting it, municipalities getting it. Um, it's, it's in the news in a way that it never, ever has been before. Um, if anybody saw the article this past weekend about the lack of starter homes in the New York Times, um, it's, it's more prominent right now in, in this up market that we, you know, is, is it stopping? Is it keep, keep it going? Um, but I think that, that translates also to the more support from policymakers, more support from, from funders, and, and so many buyers. You, you know, the, the, you don't even really have to think about the, the marketing compared to what might be coming in, in a down market. Um, and, and again, I already talked a little bit about this, but resales are, are, are typically much easier except during a pandemic. And so it, it, I, I'm feeling for our current stock of land trust homeowners that are contemplating selling and what, you know, are they gonna be able to keep this going? Because it's, it's been a, a crazy time for for folks to think about what comes next, trying because for them trying to buy in an up market is also harder, right? So, one more question about the down market. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of your existing <clears throat> CLP homeowners and how their incomes, I don't know if you experienced how their incomes were impacted during the last recession and their financial meltdown, and were there people who are having trouble still paying their mortgage or facing foreclosure, and how did you? So I, I'll take a crack at this, and then I think Washburn sh should too, because I th it's really different. Like Dul Duluth is a stunted market. We don't get the highs or the lows that, that the Twin Cities get in the same way that they don't quite follow the coast uh, down here. Um, my recollection is when the crash happened, we, we had folks who were um, losing their homes more because of, of, of job loss. So we, we didn't allow our homeowners to get subprime mortgages. And so the, the folks that had foreclosures happen to them, it, it was more just due to economic hard times or just the same reason we always see foreclosures, which is, you know, medical crises, divorces, um, you, you, know, you know, that sort of personal stuff that happens as opposed to a big uh, uptick in, in um, because of how they finance their homes. I, I would agree. I think looking back over the last 20 years, um, the level of, of households that have fallen in delinquency, I'm looking to Shane because she may correct me on this, um, has, and or foreclosures that have occurred have, has been pretty consistent regardless of what the market was doing. I think there's different supports that have been out there. I think my biggest fear is the one that's happening right now, that at least in Minnesota, multiple levels of government have been providing stopgap big chunks of money to keep people afloat uh, who maybe 
left a job or went back to part time two years ago, and there's been backfill and they've been able to keep things going. And at least in my opinion, there's a very steep cliff that we're coming up on that I think we'll probably hit as a state by the end of this year, if not sooner. Um, and I don't think there'll be any more help. Um, and so my fear is that we're going to start seeing some delinquency letters. We're going to start seeing some potential foreclosures happening. Uh, and they've already been, I mean, they've been living frugally. This is about, <laughs> and this is more of a psychology or so, you know, sociology kind of uh, thought more so than, than economics is that people have gotten into a place where maybe they're not working at the levels they were three years ago. And it's going to take, I think I have faith that they'll be able to jumpstart it and get back into uh, an income rhythm, but I think it's going to happen too little too late, and it's going to take some time for folks to get back into the, the income side of their equation, and we're going to lose some folks. And so just being really cognizant and aware that in this market, and this is, this is the game I think we're going to be playing as, as CLTs, that there are going to be situations where maybe the numbers line up right now for us to buy back a property and keep somebody from falling into foreclosure. Um, We'll just buy it back, save them from the foreclosure. But I think there's the potential that we may hit a, a, a market fall, <laughs> in, which will quickly erode our affordability gap. And then we'll be in this really tight place where maybe interest rates are shooting up and, and we're going to be sitting on real estate for a while. And so thinking about what are some alternative strategies for us to cash flow those, those properties and or be in for a longer haul of a year or two or three where we're, we're holding properties. Um, in thinking about back to that organizational sustainability, do you have what it takes to be able to weather that on five, 10, you know, percent of your portfolio? And, and, and you start talking about some big, big numbers and we've made these promises to the community that we can keep them affordable, we can, can keep them productive, but it may require us to think back in some ways, you know, look to Ben, you know, we coming out of foreclosure crisis, we worked with his former organization and, 47 contract for deed to home ownerships, and, and that, that was the model that worked at the time, but it takes a lot of energy organizationally to do something like that, and there's definite pitfalls in thinking about that. Conversation over the past two, three days has been about mortgages and home ownership, kind of the classic route, and I think, at least in my mind, I'm thinking <laughs> contract for deeds, lease own, you know, what are the strategies that we can to do to take advantage of some of these potential things that might be coming around the corner to us? Sorry. Yeah, we can shift to. Uh, so just uh, a bunch of upmarket things. Many of these things are super evident to you all because that's what we've been working in, right? Um, but you know the the massive amounts of affordability gap we've been needing to make homes uh, work for the folks that we serve. Um, also, the, just the the competitiveness of the market of buying them. It's a small miracle we were even able to buy homes for ACT Rehab work in the last year. It was I, I was so relieved when we got to February and we had like everything purchased that we needed for the for the next 12, 13, 14 months worth of work. But um, you know it impacts home quality when when the reason we got into ACT Rehab in the first place back in the day was because it, we you, you couldn't you know, before the foreclosure crisis, you, we couldn't afford to do it. Like the, the, the junk in Duluth, that, what, what, it would cost so much money to buy and fix something up. And so it's, it's shifting our scopes of work as the market continues to go up. We're doing less and less work to the homes that we're doing and more of the money's just going into affordability gap, right? Um, the other piece that's tricky is in that up market is, is buyer's ability to compete with the complications around knitting together all of our, our resources to make a deal happen um, compared to a cash buyer in, in Duluth. We're, we're seeing some folks from, you know, that, that work at, at Google buying a house in Duluth because they, they can. And, you know, our land trust buyers can't, can't compete with that. Um, but, you know, people like to live next to the big lake. Um, I, I don't know if folks remember this, but when when the market started turning up after the crisis, uh, foreclosure crisis, um, I, I remember distinctly feeling like these, gosh darn contractors are trying to get back everything they lost in the last five years 
in the first 18 months of an up market, like our pricing just flipped fast, and it would it, like all of our performers for the projects we had going, it was like they, we had to reconnoiter them three months in a row to get back on track and, and, and have pricing that worked. Um, so again, for me, it's almost like the turning points are trickier than when you're solidly in that market. But um, I, I think another one that we, we may be seeing it differently with interest rates rising now, even, even as the market, so if the market doesn't crash completely or go down significantly, if those interest rates keep going up, are we going to see, you know, buyers at closer to 80% AMI being our average buyer? For the work we do, we've typically designed the sale prices of our homes to be at about 60% of very median income. That's who's needed help in our market the most. That's that's who's seemed more um, a long-term affordable home is something that they can see to, see to buy, like that it makes sense for them. Uh, uh, folks that are closer to 80% of AMI in our experience are are the buyers that have, you know, some extenuating family circumstances that keep them from being as economically viable as, as a typical 80% family. And, and so I think like, you know, we may see that titching up w with interest rates going up and People are different, so it'll be it'll just going to be interesting to see like what, how how is serving the families at that income range versus the folks that are at, at sixty, um, and then and then of course this, you know, the the saddest piece is is just folks giving up, um, <laughs> just giving up hope and being like the throwing in the towel, and and I think we've started to see a little bit of that with the with in the up market that we're in where folks are just like that's that's it I'm out I, I can't do it. Um, so, Especially with fears of, of interest rates, I think that probably complicates yeah. that, that notion. And, and so some navigating thoughts of, about these, um, it, it's the time, right, to build the case, whether that's for policy or, or for funding shifts. And I think we've had folks from our organization and I think other, other folks in the land trust scene and in, in, in the single family scene in general in the state have been it's not been an accident that during this up market we've been bonding together and pushing harder. Like we've been more active trying to get policy changes and funding to work better and be more appropriately sized for what we're trying to do. Um, it, partly because there's more receptivity. Um, we, in, in Minnesota, for folks who haven't been tracking, we've had almost more luck working with the Republican controlled Senate to get to get funding for home ownership in the in the last five years that we've had um, with the governor or, or the or the or the house um, with the exception of the, the the people of color and indigenous caucus in the house it's been this really interesting mix of, of, of bedfellows and it, that's 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 up market times where the need is pretty demonstrable and I can't quite understand why we're so resonating with the Senate Republicans, but 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 we'll just keep riding that horse as long as it works. Um, yeah, I don't. I think I'm not going to just walk us all through these because um, it's they're fairly self-evident. Um, you, you know, the the one thing I like about an up market is is not having to explain development gap to people because <laughs> that's that's just flipping maddening right but um it's you know when when the market is down that 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 value gap or development gap is there again and how do you how do you navigate that you know paying more than something is worth to 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 build it um is is does it ever exist in colorado i don't know it has i mean right now no yeah so but it's not much much here either um but yeah so all of these things you know and on the one hand it's it back to what i said earlier it's like there's this this is the time to build the case this is the time where there's the most public sympathy for affordable housing and 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 it'll be interesting to see what comes next right so yeah um you know in some ways i, I would have loved to have thought about this maybe from a strategy perspective like if, if a year from now the market's here, these are the steps that we would recommend all of us start taking. But not knowing where things are gonna go, not knowing where interest rates are, uh, not knowing how some of these potential fall-offs may, may hit and impact our markets. Um, you know, it feels like a lot is different from 2010, 2009, when things were falling apart. 
Um, and I also think there's some, some recent memory there that hopefully will lend to, to responding better and quicker the next time around. But, but the situation may be different enough that, that we won't be able to, to take those apples and, and try and bring them to today's apples in the comparison. You know, to, to Ben's comment in the back, talking about, you know, the city calling and say we got, you know, foreclosure, or we got this property we want you all to purchase. Um, down market opportunities. There were a lot of foreclosures and short sale opportunities sitting out there and investors were stepping in and gobbling them up. My, my fear, and maybe this is a, a shift on, it is just kind of recognizing where we are today. Um, uh, we, <laughs> Fannie Mae initiated a foreclosure on, on a land trust homeowner. She, she just up and moved back to Chicago pre-COVID. So, um, uh, the delinquency and foreclosure process is initiated in the spring of 2020. Um, <laughs> despite quarterly, if not monthly, trying and, and putting forward several offers to buy back this property from Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae still owns this property. And I have a thousand percent confidence in that if the market starts, and, I, and I'd love to hear from folks, I don't know if you're on the, the home path uh, kind of tickler that, that Fannie Mae has set up nationally that if, if there's, you know, in our case, if there's a home that's going for, through foreclosure in Minneapolis, I get a little email saying, hey, you might be interested in buying this property from us. You get this first look opportunity as a nonprofit and being a home path partner um, to do that. Um, I am starting to see an increase in, in those notices coming from Fannie Mae. And a lot of it was just back you know, uh, backed up situations that are, are just working themselves free from, from the COVID situation. But I, I have no confidence that Fannie Mae and maybe Freddie Mac's in a better position and maybe local lenders are in a better position. But if things really start to fray and fall apart, um, I question the system's ability 10 short years later from where we were to be able to respond and think about remedies and ways to, to put those properties back in productive and or affordable use. I also sit on the, our land bank's board of directors, and I've brought up several times over the last six months, are we thinking about, because we were a conduit for the National Community Stabilization Trust entity. And so our land bank was you know, you know, kind of, I mean, Mikia, you were working there at the time, right? Like you had, a, you, had a, you had a bat phone relationship with them, and as properties came available, Makia and, and, and team at the land bank were, were getting in touch with folks like us on the ground with Habitat and others and saying, hey, you want it, you want it? And they were brokering and they were picking stuff up and there was a system put in place. I don't think NCS, NCST is, is in a position to act in that way. I clearly don't think our land bank is in a position to, to respond to that. And to get that, that car back on the road and get the, <laughs> the the, the squirrel nests out of the engine is going to take a, a good year, right, to get that, that up and working again. And we're already going to be way behind investors if and when that happens. Yes, it was, uh, so it was a first book program, and um, there were thousands of properties that were coming through. Um, but we were able to work with for profit developers and make them non profit developers by requiring they sell to um, low to moderate income homeowners if they were to be part of our first book program and to, you know, pay to support you know our other nonprofit work but we got a lot of properties that were donated um, but I agree that uh, you know in CST we should really start actually having some conversations with them right now to figure out what what is the strategy to move forward with that uh, including the land bank to which uh, like I would love to come back and you know not, I don't want to work for you but I could um, you know uh, we could work through what that you know program was and kind of get that revamped um yeah that it was it was it was really advantageous it, it, it now is the time to have the conversation yes. with the county our local lenders with fanny and freddie to say we don't want just discounted sales on the challenged homes or the challenging neighborhoods we want it across the board that when there is and there will be foreclosures and, and forfeitures in the wealthier parts of the twin cities we want equal access and equal discounting on those. Don't pick and choose, because now is our opportunity to try and get some footholds into some neighborhoods where it's gonna be really, really difficult once the market picks back up to create affordability. Some of the comments will tell, it's like, some of these conversations are easier had now because nobody's thinking about it. And so can we get commitments from lenders? Can we get commitments from politicians to say, yeah, we'll commit to it. We don't think it's gonna happen. 
you know, we're a little bit more open to it. And when, when they're trying to, you know, salvage as much revenue as possible, banks, when everything is going to crap, if they if they can get they get everything out of it that they can on a property, uh, they'll do that. And, and and it's only ones where they've already written it off six months ago, which was the case in the mortgage foreclosure crisis. Anything they got on was better because six months ago they had written off the whole thing. And and how do we get ahead of that and get those commitments so that we can we can create the opportunity for ourselves? If, if we can work through the NC, if we can try to get back through the um, National Stabilization Trust program. All properties uh, came through, not just in disadvantaged neighborhoods, and some of that were, were pennies on the dollars that we that uh, were donated. Um, and so, I do think that we should really take another crack, take a crack at that. I'm just curious about that that Fannie. Um, they're they're paying a ground lease to you guys, though. No. Oh no. 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 Okay. It's, you, st you still own the land. We're still we're still booking that at some point okay. in time. Yeah. But they haven't been paying their, their monthly grant lease. They have not. No. And and you have, have you gone back to Fannie to say? Not not on the ground lease. Um, okay. uh, we're just trying to get them to get unstuck on it. I right. politically, I think my my next step is just to reach out reach out to our congressperson and our our our, our senators and just just say this thing needs to get unstuck immediately. This is a very broken situation. And if you start replicating this, y'all are going to have a huge, huge issue on your hands because their, their, their process is, is, is not working. Yeah. And from the get-go, we've been willing to pay sure. what they had into it. And they okay. just keep making dumb decision after dumb decision. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, serve, serve lower income households easier. Uh, I was I was really concerned during the, the foreclosure crisis whether or not our, we have a home buyer initiated program, buyers go out and choose a home of their choice and we match it with funds. And I really thought that our homeowners would have a tough time competing with investors. The net of that is that we were able to serve as many if not more and we were able to serve way lower income households because we were able to, to the credit of our city, be able to use NSP funds for both affordability gap and some deferred um, maintenance work on those homes and and some of our most affordable homes were captured when that market was low and we were able to come in with some pretty significant affordability gap when the faucets were open to to really create some affordability the net of that is a number of those households who, who bought back then you know are selling what they purchased their hundred thousand dollar home for three hundred thousand but on resale you know this summer we were selling several three hundred thousand dollar valued homes for $100,000 to, to lower income households are really being able to, to create some wickedly affordable homes uh, because of the timing when those when the first households purchased. And, and I don't know quite how it's different here than in Duluth, but when the market was really down for us, we didn't see, we saw a very small lag in buyer demand at the beginning of it. And then, it, and then it was business as usual, and we sold houses like hotcakes, because in Duluth, if you're a poorer family, and, and you're in the rental scene, it, it's a bad deal. Our housing stock is so old, and the, and the folks that are, you know, that is super common for people that we sell a house to, and this, this maybe is the case for all of you, but to, that they move once a year if they're living in rental housing, trying to find something that's better and more sustainable for their family. And so we were every realtor's good pal during that time period because we continued to pay the, the, the commissions that were paid in the up market. Like we didn't, there was all this discounting of commissions that happened and we just kept paying the regular thing and realtors were bringing us buyers left and right. Huge upside. Uh, appraisal based uh, a session yesterday uh, um, our colleague from Door County they use a, a, a fixed fixed rate appreciation model and so I, I, I could see some potential situation where maybe it doesn't work out as well but that example or the examples that I, I gave just now folks who purchased back in 2010 11 um, this summer when they sold they their share the amount that they walked away with at, from the land trust closing uh, was you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, um, and I think one of the things we're always concerned about is you know our households walking away with enough to be able to then go out and purchase a market rate home if they chose to, because there was so much upside. The appreciation went up by two, two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. 
know, 25 percent of that was still a pretty good chunk of money for for the households who left so there's a there's, there's a strong potential for for a large upswing when when the markets react the way that they have over the last 10 years converse of what mr corey was talking about uh, my hope is we'll see better pricing from contractors i don't know what the supply chain is going to do and if we're ever going to see you know a two by four you know back to the prices where they were four years ago but hopefully they'll be more aggressive in their pricing and there'll be more contractors back in the space that we work i mean what would i think we've all experienced is we sometimes can't even get anybody to bid on our jobs because they they, they got gravy right now and and uh until there's, there's not as much gravy it's going to be tough for us to compete and, and why work with all the other added requirements that that we layer onto a contractor if they don't need to do it um, so, so yeah. in the down market, though, did you find contractors were more than willing to work with you? I think we 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 really deepened a lot of relationships with with contractors, and a number of them have stuck through That's with what us. That's I was going to say. So, yeah. So you built that relationship in the down market. Yeah. They got business as opposed to not because what I remember for us was like the cranes in Denver. Those were affordable housing development deals back in 2010. I mean, it was not a lot of market rate stuff happening. And so the contractors you build relationships back then, remember? Yeah. Um, and so that, that is, a, I think, a really important value to have when you're talking about in the up market. So right. anyway. On the construction side, Jeff, since you all have your own construction company itself, can you speak to how, I guess, I mean, the ups and downs in pricing, how has that impacted or how have you been insulated from that by having your own internal? It's not as as sweet as one might think from the outside. <laughs> you don't get to just pick up the phone and say, yeah, I gotta go lower net. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, so what I, what I will say is this, uh, until the last four years or so, we, we used our construction company more as a tool than as a business. And so it was break even all the time. And so those relationship things bear out and helped out um, and but you know the reality is for about 15 years they took it in the shorts when we hit a bump a physical bump in the road and we've kind of committed to that not happening anymore um, so we still have more control because we can shift things more but I you know if, if you're using at least this is how our participating jurisdiction treats us if you're using federal dollars that flow through a a municipality for construction of affordable housing and you have your own general contractor you have to bid every material and every subcontract you don't have to bid your carpentry labor um, or any labor you self-perform but um, so we, we as a consequence are only using our construction company for our acquisition rehab work because um, we just can't we can't get competitive pricing if we're doing a whole new construction. And so we're better off on the new construction working with a general contractor, of, of which there are two that are useful to us in our whole damn service area. Um, and one, one that's only reliably useful. Um, but they can, they can do all of the things that a regular business person does to get the best price they can do and then bid against often nobody else because we don't really have much competition, but they beat the pants off anybody else they bid on. Um, because they they don't have to bid every two by four, so um, it works great for the act we have because there's so much fluidity and so much choice of like what we're going to choose to address in the house and what we're not. But so you're saying it's more advantageous not to do it internally, but to have someone else be the GC for new construction. I think that's been our experience. Yeah. And I just, this last bullet point is, is very nuanced, and I, I think you could look at it and read it in a number of different ways. I think when, when I put it on the slide, it was kind of that experience with the buyer-initiated program that because there was more available stock, that buyers that were buying through our buyer-initiated program uh, had the opportunity to look at more properties. Uh, you know, and they were, Again, they were out there competing against investors, but I think there was just... There's more opportunity for them to put in offers and, and hopefully land one, especially if it was a uh, uh, maybe not a lender, maybe not going through 
National Community Stabilization Trust, but but through a, a willing seller who saw the the potential to sell to an owner occupied household versus an investor. Uh, back then, they, they 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 kind of rose to the top of the the, the offer stack. We, we turned a lot of dogs into really great houses during that time period with, yeah. with, with our act rehab program in, in ways that we can't now. You know, now now invariably it's instead of transforming a dog, we talk about putting lipstick on a pig. Um, so if if the doom and gloom of more me than than Jeff Corey, but if the doom and gloom plays itself out, what what are what are your some of your fears um, from an organizational perspective um, that that you all are, are thinking through uh, today and or what what's kind of the worst case scenario for your organizations? <laughs> well, I think in both down and up markets, I think one of the things um, we've always looked at is what kind of access to capital can we get to go and, you know, be competitive in the market. Um, and in a down market, um, clearly, I mean, we were, we were buying properties that otherwise we had no business buying. Like, we, would just not, we wouldn't have the financial means to compete um, with, with the market, but in that down market. Some of it was NSP, so we were able to use NSP money. And I should clarify, we, we don't do home ownership, so we were much more focused on uh, multifamily rental or buying land that ultimately would get developed for multifamily rental housing. Um, so access to capital, and, and one of those things, and, and maybe you're gonna get, I, I, do you have like a, a financial model of like, hey, here, is that something you're gonna be talking about, or? No. Okay, so I don't, all right, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May I, may I, yeah, may I, do it. Just, I'm gonna throw this out as, because I, I think it's something we in the land trust world need to do more of, and I'm curious for you guys, do, do you, all the land that you are ultimately owning, the time that you put into buying that land, are you capitalizing your staff time that goes into the purchase of that land and into that deal? And the reason I ask is, I think one of the things we've been really focused on is, really trying to show the land value is highest, you know, market value for the land, what we record on our balance sheet is different than what we are obviously charging on a ground rent, those kinds of things. But by having, you know, a stronger balance sheet land that's debt free, that allows us to get lines of credit, you know, we can go to a bank and say, okay, because we have X amount, you know, of assets and we have this land that has no debt on it, we're, we're looking for a half million dollar line of credit to allow us to, you know, to buy something or a million, you know. But that, to me, is something I wonder, do you guys think about that for how to leverage? In a, again, for a down or an up market, it's, to me, it is critical is this access to capital. Because I can't wait on the city or the state to kind of go through the process of saying, okay, we'll award you guys a million dollars to go do this or two. That's going to take way too long. So my question is, and I, and I do think about this often, and we don't, but what's what's the lender's recourse if we default? Right, it's against. I hear you. Right, yeah, no, right, I know. Right, right. I, I I hear you. That's true. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. But I'm not securing their debt against the land. So to be clear, against your balance sheet. I'm, I, it is against the balance sheet. That's true. But I'm not. I'm yeah. not. Go, I'm not. I hear you. Our balance sheet looks healthy, but if you like strip it all down, there's not too much there because the, the money is really in the affordability gap in those homes. Right? Well, but I'm not suggesting go borrow far more than what's on your. I'm just saying if you got a balance sheet, let's say you have 10 million worth of assets and land, you're not going to go borrow 10 million, but maybe you're going to borrow two or two and a half. And yeah, it is it is recourse because it's against your balance sheet versus being non non recourse against the property. So, you do I, that? I mean, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the mo it strikes me, though, the model that you sh shared with Flood and me a few weeks back, there's applicability of what Aaron's talking about in that, right? Where you're, you're going after some long-term patient capital, you could try to play it that way. Yeah. Um, you know, to get either someone else to pay the holding costs on it right. or... You know, that makes some sense. What we're going to be pushing on next, our, the city where we do most of our work has an infill building program that's 
have just been broken. And so our big push is to try to throw a bunch of ARPA money at that to set the table for many years of new construction. And I think one of the one of the things that this is making me really aware of is the need to have the conversation with them about how with the city about this needs to happen and it might be the case that we can't build anything for x number of years if the market turns down but that doesn't mean we don't we don't stay and wait right you know like we should still do it because it will come back that's the one thing i think also that i wanted to say kind of at the start of this was i, I just saw a stat 7.6 times property home prices have increased 7.6 times more than income since 1965 yeah. Yeah. right so so we're probably going to see some downtimes but it's probably also going to come back and keep going in the same direction where the haves have more and the haves have nots have less and so i i think that longer view is is there and you're you're more worldly with thinking about the debt than i am <laughs> 